All right, Amy's going to be talking on transients. So Amy, the floor is yours when, whenever you're ready. Okay, I've had to work on my microphone. Can everybody hear me? I can. Excellent. So good evening, my name is Amy Williams and my presentation is on the existential paradox of transients. Is it a key component for meaningfulness or a validation of insignificance? Um, this is a sensitive topic, just like Brad's was. So um, I've attempted to be mindful of others' feelings and well-being, but please do whatever necessary for your your own well-being. Um, I will tell you now that I am probably going to mutilate some of these words that I'm going to be saying, but I'm going to do my best and just move on. So my apologies if I do. And as far as um, starting off, this first slide, I have a short movie clip from the movie Blended starring Adam Sandler and Drew Barrymore. The idea is to start us off with the right perspective. So I'm going to do my best to share that right quick. So my apologies on kind of having it on mute there at the beginning, but basically it just showed that depending on who was watching the character come down the steps, everybody had a little bit of a different perspective. One felt the empowering um, song that was playing, which I don't think you guys got to hear. The other was Adam Sandler's character hearing a love song, and then her son was hearing the end of the world song, just showing that each of us have the ability to control how we view and interact with our world. The other two images on this um, slide are just emphasizing the importance of perspective and perception. And then as far as this slide, it's just the common themes appearing throughout the perspectives that I reviewed. Um, I did not find any articles disputing that positive emotions and a high sense of meaning in life um, generally that they do not, they generally result in better mental health, physical health, and overall well-being. And then this one shows what information I'll be reviewing. It will include research results, the Buddhist views, Stoic views, and nihilist and atheist views on transients. The uh, one article that I read is um, pertaining to the desire to end life, and the article was Ready to Give Up on Life, the Lived Experience of Elderly People Who Feel Life is Completed and No Longer Worth Living. In this study, mentally and physically healthy elderly people with specific criteria were interviewed and their wish to die due to um, feeling life had reached its end point um, was evaluated. The ideal participant was one that did not have any serious health issues and no depression, anxiety, or other mental health issues. Um, with the elderly participants selected and interviews completed, five components were found to be significant. Loneliness, whether they still were interacting with others, um, was explained as a feeling of being distanced from, from others and loved ones. One participant explained his loneliness stemmed from no longer feeling needed by his now grown children and potentially even being a hindrance to them. The feeling of being insignificant related to no longer providing support or inspiration for the next generation since their children had grown and lived on their own, leaving the workforce and therefore no longer making um, contributions to society and no longer being valued as having relevant or useful insights or abilities. The explanation for lack of expression related to the capabilities of individuals in their younger years that were lost due to the aging process. Physical capabilities such as painting were gone, along with visual impairments hindering their ability to appreciate things such as beautiful works of art. Tiredness has many aspects, including physical fatigue, mental weariness, and even existential exhaustion. Some, con um, some contributing factors include chronic illness that results in the physical deterioration of their bodies, increased levels of pain, emotional pain about previous traumas, and missed opportunities that they now have ample time to reflect upon. The change in their abilities leave many feeling as though they cannot be actively engaged in the world anymore, but are just destined to live out their days killing time. Lastly, something I can strongly relate to is the fear of dependence. 
In general, the consensus seems to be ending life while still in control and independent is the far better option than going through the process of dying naturally. Some of the key takeaways from this research is the need to improve healthcare to address the needs and concerns of the elderly and how vital meeting their psychological needs are for their well being. When determining if transience allows for a meaningful life, even though it is limited, this research provides support in favor of it, in my opinion. The information on this slide comes from my review of the article, Meaning in Life and Mortality by Krauss, 2009. This study evaluated the correlation between meaning in life and mortality in the elderly population. Correlational support for a lowered risk of mortality when one has a strong sense of meaning in life is based on the improved immune system response with positive emotions, the beneficial effects of regularly attending religious services and remaining socially engaged. It is also noted that these benefits diminish with time and lose their usefulness. Of equal importance, Krauss reveals that understanding what forms our foundations, like our beliefs, values, and standards, allows for reconciliation of our lives during the introspection period in old age. If we can successfully align what was hoped for in life and what was accomplished in life, we gain a deeper sense of meaning. The consequences of not overcoming this developmental stage are detrimental to the individual's sense of hope. On this slide, more of Krauss's research findings are discussed. Study findings identify uh, purpose in life as the greatest contributor to lowering mortality risk. Correlations were noted between a lack of meaning in life and increased likelihood of maladaptive behaviors, whereas a strong sense of meaning in life provides cushioning from harmful behaviors and symptoms of depression. In this article, the chain of association is as follows. The meaning in life leads to positive emotions, which in turn leads to an improved immune system functioning, which undoubtedly leads to longevity in the elderly. This study also lends support to life being meaningful, even though it is limited. Reviewing the brief article Embracing the Transients of Life is True Wisdom by Lee, 2020, provided two important tools to develop mindfulness, accepting change and letting go of attachments. Developing the skill of mindfulness includes acknowledging our lives are limited and appreciating the freedom that comes from detaching oneself from the feelings of ownership and possessiveness. With mindfulness, we gain the ability to live in the moment and accept that our lives do end at some point. This article is similar to the serenity prayer stating that wisdom is gained when transience is fully accepted. This is another supportive article in favor of transience allowing life to be meaningful even though it is limited. Here I discuss one of the three articles of Buddhist views on transience titled Impermanence in Buddha Nature by Fisher 2021. He starts his article with the declaration, impermanence is a reminder for the meaning of our existence. To help readers relate to the statement, the example of New Year's Eve, New Year's Day is given. Just as our lives have impermanence, so do other aspects of our world. This holiday signifies to many an ending of one chapter and the beginning of a new one. The emotions associated with this holiday correlate with the emotions experienced with other beginnings and endings, which include happiness and sadness. With impermanence, we are motivated to be mindful and live life fully. Without impermanence, how would one appreciate existence? This provides the notion that given an endless lifespan, life could potentially be meaningless. The second article pertaining to Buddhist views on transience titled Anika or Anita in Buddhism by Jayaram provides even more relatable examples of impermanence in our lives. Everyday, biolo everyday biological changes within our bodies, such as cells dying and being replaced by new ones, or life experiences associated with aging, such as the figurative death of each stage of life as we move to a new one, reflects our ability to accept impermanence on a micro level. As expressed by other scholars, only your perception, attitude, and reaction to circumstances are within your control in reference to impermanence. Considering all aspects of dying as it relates to cells, people, and animals, our world would not be sustainable if impermanence wasn't a reality. To alleviate the negative association with impermanence, one recommendation includes the practice of mindfulness. And my final article that discusses Buddhist views on transience is Impermanence in Buddhism, Anika by O'Brien, 2018. She covers toxic attributes such as ignorance, greed, and hate. As explained in the article, toxic attri attributes, or I'm sorry, um, the toxic attributes are detrimental along with the people's belief in life um, being endless. Um, she also describes how letting go of a belief in permanence and accepting our limited lifetime will ultimately lead to liberation and enlightenment. Many existentialists discuss the same concept, but this concept is not commonplace in our society. 
the Buddhist views add another positive argument for a meaningful life, even though we only have a limited time to live. One of my favorite articles reviewed for this assignment was Perspective Stoicism and Death Acceptance, Integrating Stoic Philosophy and Cognitive Behavior Therapy for Death Anxiety by Menzies and Whittle, 2022. This article thoroughly explains the Stoic perspective and its application for death anxiety. An important part of Stoic philosophy is understanding what is within our control. When one cannot control circumstances, they are left with control over their response to those circumstances. This is not an easy feat, but with patience and practice, learning to hone responding skills to controllable circumstances is possible. Applications of Stoicism to alleviate death anxiety include four components. First is the symmetry argument. Some speculate that fear and anxiety about death arise from the unknown state of non-existence. With the symmetry argument, non-existence is introduced in familiar terms. Acknowledging that time before birth is the previous experience of non-being that most do not give a second thought to provides insight into non-being after death. Once individuals can recognize that they have experienced nothingness before, fear and anxiety relating to nothingness of death can be eased. Next is the idea that death as something everyone, including all other living things, will experience. Recalling people you know, whether personally or because of their notoriety, who have passed away, regardless of their status in life, their, their lives ended. Also realizing that hundreds of people die every minute throughout the world, regardless of their culture, beliefs, or location, their lives end as well. Appreciating these points provides a sense of fellowship. We are not in this alone. The importance of perspective on the length of our lifetime. Some view our lives as short, but we live far longer than some insects whose lifespans only last approximately 24 hours. Acknowledging that quality of life lived is far more important than the length of time lived nurtures an attitude of gratitude. Another nourishing realization is the complex probabilities that each of us specifically came into existence at all. This relates to all the pieces of our DNA puzzle that had to fit together just right in order for our genetic makeup to be created. Finally, utilize, utilizing daily reminders of death is helpful to alleviate death anxiety. One daily reminder example was the symbolic hourglass. This was personally relevant for me because I chose an hourglass pendant for my father's cremains. I was surprised by the numerous options available for death reminders, things like websites, ringtones, and screensavers. The whole point of the above is to help make death seem like a normal part of life that does not require feeling afraid. Even though more re research in this area is necessary, this article supports that our lives have immense potential for uh, many in spite of our limited lifespans. This slide discusses neutral acceptance, which is the acceptance of death as a natural process of life. After completing the death ad attitude profile revised, the DAPR, those scoring high in this category were better equipped to care for patients in hospice type settings. They opposed extending life through unnatural means and overall they had better physical and psychological um, health. The overall message of this article emphasizes the correlation between stoic views of death and the alleviation of death anxiety through utilization of the four components discussed. Oh, I'm so sorry. Moving to the articles that may support transience as validation of insignificance of our lives, I reviewed Transience, the Angst of Existence by James Clark Ross, 2018. Ross indicates the nihilistic view of life as being devoid of meaning and indicates life's primary purpose is to satisfy our human desires in order to be happy. For nihilists, believing life has meaning is considered erroneous and freedom results from dispelling this myth. In this view, lifespan contributes to the belief that life is meaningless and existence is dreadful. In contrast to the nihilistic view, atheists do not discount the ability to have a meaningful life. For atheists, living morally, seeking pleasure, and surviving are incorporated into finding purpose. Contrary to Christian beliefs, there is no afterlife and certainty of non-existence with death. In conclusion, the direct correlation between our limited lifespan and meaningfulness and value was not noted, but the ability to have a meaningful life despite our lifespan was mentioned. The question of transience being a component for meaningfulness or a validation of insignificance cannot be answered simply. The confounding variables that are present from person to person prevent a single solution from being generalizable to the entire population. Considerations for each individual, including needs, culture, and beliefs, must be established and research designs must incorporate and account for these factors. Just as individuals choose a religion or belief system, Integrating results from research that incorporates the factors best resembling one's own would have the greatest potential for the desired outcome. 
The next slide is just a list of my references, and this concludes my presentation. Are there any questions that I can answer? Questions, comments for Amy? Clearly did all, you know, put a lot of energy and time into researching your topic, Amy. I apologize, it was probably a little lengthy and I talk a little fast, but oh. other than that, it was a very fabulous topic to research. Yeah, and your, t your timing was very good, just the timing. And no, I thought you shared some fascinating research. The Menzies and Whittle article really is, I agree with you, it was a really good one. And some of the other ones sounded great too. People, questions, comments from your classmates? I was sad that not as many pretty um, slides as so many other people had. So I apologize for the boring words and <laughs> bright state colors. That's about all I had. I think it was a lot of, of very meaningful and helpful information. And when you talked about the notion of fellowship, that we're not alone in this when we die, and you know, it's that's so uh, what a wonderful thought, and it's so counter to the way a lot some exist, existentialists think. They talk about how you know we have to face death alone, and that's part of our existential anxiety, and our existential isolation, is that we're born into this world alone, we have to die alone. But you know, you make a great point, Amy, that there's that, and I. I know that I think Menzies and Whittle shared that too, but you make a great point that there's a sense of fellowship in knowing that we're not alone in this. This is something everyone faces. I appreciated your cautionary notes at the beginning too, inviting people to do what they need to do to be take care of their own well being and that you're on a sensitive subject here. Do Brad did a much better job of, of putting a, a notice up there. So when I had mine, Present, uh, presentation put together, I kind of felt like I slacked off a bit because he did such a good job with his, but definitely, definitely talking about death is not an easy topic for people in general. Well, I thought, I thought you handled it very well. I thought your remarks at the opening, you know, showed a lot of sensitivity and concern for your classmates. I thought it was good. Well, others thoughts on transients? Alexis? Just going back to what you said about um, that one study about those um, elderly people who were asked about like um, ending their own lives or having their lives end. This kind of just makes me like that. That mindset kind of just reminds me of how I think like people who say like they want to live to be a hundred. Like this is just my own opinion. Like why would anybody want to live to be that old? I don't know. I feel like there is kind of like a cutoff mark for things like that. And I thought that was very interesting. Yeah. And the, the fact that the people were healthy and had good psychological mental health was pretty amazing to me that, you know, it's not like they were deteriorate. I mean, that's my biggest fear is that I'm going to be incapable of, of caring for myself and that type of thing. But these were healthy, uh, you know, adults that were, um, you know, I want to say 60, 70 plus, you know, it was definitely the elderly population and there was nothing wrong with them, but they just felt like, you know, life was, life was done and that it was time to call it. And I thought that was amazing. Yeah. I totally get that because like from two perspectives, because as somebody, um, on the one perspective, somebody who herself has like, like I've watched my grand, my great grandmother, um, deteriorate from uh if she doesn't have like full-blown alzheimer's yet she definitely has like the beginning or middle stages of dementia and i just can't imagine living like like that like not in an insulting way of course but like just like that happening to me it's like one of my biggest fears and, and I think that's hard for yeah. every, like, it's not just hard for the person, but it's hard for family too. And yeah. the fact that we don't have a way to, well, some places do to end our lives by choice right. that I think it, because there are some people that knowing that's happening would definitely take that route. And it seems sad that we don't have that option available to us. And yeah, not to keep going, but like the other perspective, I thought like, 
most people when you think of like putting an end to your own life you think like oh you're suicidal and you want it all to end because you're suffering or there's something going on and it's kind of refreshing to hear about people like who are mentally sound um who uh, feel that way too so i thought that was nice absolutely other thoughts? You made me think in what the discussion you just had, Alexis and Amy, of uh, Yellum, uh, Urban Yellum's most recent book for, uh, that he wrote together with his wife, who uh, has since died a couple years ago, um, on, on um, matter of, of life, death and life, if I got the title right. And, you know, she in the story, she chooses a physician assisted uh, death because euthanasia, because she's just in such intense pain in her condition. It's not that her mental faculties have left her, that she's lost those. It's just, well, she's lost quality of life due to that, but quality of life has been lost because she's in, in agony. Um, so. And it's amazing how long the human body can hang on. And even though, like even Frankel's case with the the Jewish people, like you would, you would not imagine that the human body could possibly maintain life in the conditions that, that their bodies were in. But amazingly enough, life can endure under the worst of circumstances. And for us not to have an option to basically opt out of that existence is, is unfortunate. It is becoming yeah. a thing, but it's certainly not commonplace. Yeah, Amy, that was a terrific point about what, like you said, with Frankel, and it reminded me, it was reminiscent of what Brad said last week, uh, Brad's comment too, about how, you know, we really are uh, durable beings, you know, yeah. our death does not necessarily come easily, and if Frankel himself comments on how it was amazing, how some of the things you think they would have contracted, they did not, you know, that could have potentially been deadly in the concentration camps. And I still and love Alexis Frankel's point of view on the um, fact when he was speaking to the, the physician whose wife died and he said, you know, that you outlived her, but what if she would have had to outlive you? Like, think of what she would be going through without you. And it's just, again, that whole perspective is just amazing when you flip it and think of it in, in other ways, how it can be reassuring, if you will. Right. You know, and that for those of you who have thoughts of pursuing a future in mental health, the mental health field, you hear of things like that. And it's just so moving to realize, like you just said, Amy, the power of perspective that you're I, I'm with you. I'm so moved by that example that Frankel shared that. And, you know, and it, just what that what that meant to the client to be able to look at it in that light, that look at, yes, I'm suffering, but look at how it spared my wife that if the yeah. tables were turned. Yeah. Other thoughts? I like Amy. I liked your comments about new, you know the way that in our lives we're frequently experiencing. You know, we talk about uh, impermanence of life of our lives, but you you talked about how impermanence and transience and change. It's just it's you see it at uh, different levels all the time. And when you shared the New Year's Eve, New Year's Day example, and the fact that we're continually ending chapters, old chapters, opening new ones, I thought that was wonderful uh, parallel or the way we can think of life. I don't know. A lot of the examples that, that I came, I came across really kind of opened my eyes to the fact that we do accept that things end on several. I mean, I hadn't even considered some of the examples that, that I had mentioned because they're just such an everyday part of life. Just like, you know, we should be kind of dealing with death as an everyday part of life and not being so anxious or afraid of it that, you know, we, we can handle impermanence all the time. Like we, we do deal with it all the time. So I definitely appreciated getting to do this as my topic because it, it was very enlightening for me. Oh, good, good. I'm glad you enjoyed, enjoyed doing that as your topic. I wanna thank you for sharing personally about your father's cremains and that you have a hourglass pendant in which yeah. you keep your father's cremains. I felt so strongly about that, and I, I just almost thought it was kind of gave me a chuckle when I read that, and I, it's like an affirmation of maybe why I felt so strongly about getting his cremains into this hourglass. It was just, it tied together so perfectly. 
Yeah, it's a way that even with impermanence in the cycle of life, um, that there's ways we can still make choices that allow us to yeah. continue on, you know, continue to maintain a connection there, which Ed, you, you found a very meaningful symbolic way of doing that. So, And I almost felt like the hourglass had not only the, you know, the outward to like the people still living that we have limited time, but it almost still made me kind of look like a reflective thing on his life. Like if you're to turn the hourglass upside down and like relive his life, it kind of made me reflect upon like this childhood stories that he told me and the memories I have with him as a child. And then the memories my kids have with him as a grandpa. So it's like almost reflective for me as for his life as well. So no, not just the negative kind of life is limited, but also like, let me reappreciate the sands going, you know, through the hourglass of his life and what his life meant to me, you know? So it was definitely, it had a, quite a few different meanings behind it, but it was def it was something I connected with deeply, so. Wow, thank you for sharing that. It does sound like it had multiple meanings for you and some pretty powerful ones. Stephanie just said, what a beautiful symbol of Absolutely. love. Absolutely, yeah. Yep. Well, any other comments for a 